Mr. Speaker and ladies and gentlemen of the House, um, as most of you know, yesterday the House Appropriations Committee adopted a House budget um, with a vote of 21 to 0. And I want to thank um, the chairman of our committee, uh, Delegate Jones, and all of our subcommittee chairmen, and also all of our colleagues uh, on both sides of the aisle on the Appropriations Committee for all their hard work in these last few weeks in putting our version um, or our amendments, rather, to the governor's proposed budget um, in the vote uh, yesterday. Also, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank our staff. They have worked diligently uh, over those uh, weeks uh, to assist us and to provide uh, information and help for us as we went through that process. Chairman Jones has commented uh, a number of times related to our House budget and, and uh, the ramp up to our adoption of it on Sunday. And I agree with him totally. It is a conservative, responsibly and responsible and structurally uh, sound and balanced budget. It doesn't include any tax or fee increases, which I think is very important. It deposits $605 million in our rainy day fund. It fully funds the annual contribution to the Virginia retirement system, which all of our employees appreciate, and it pays back the payments we deferred from the VRS in 2010, and Chairman Jones and I remember when uh, that was something we had to do at that time, but now we're making that payment and making good on the promise to make that payment. It also makes responsible investments, over $70 million more than the governor proposed in his budget for K-12. through And I've heard from my colleagues on um, this side of the aisle that that is something that they very much support um, and appreciate. It includes $272 million in lottery proceeds distribution, which will provide flexibility and I think is welcome news to our schools uh, so that they will have that flexibility and they will have fewer strings attached to the funding uh, that they will receive. It also, Mr. Speaker, makes targeted investments in economic development and it emphasizes accountability and oversight for those investments that we're going to make related to economic development. Now, Mr. Speaker, many other members will highlight other specific parts of the budget, um, but I want to talk about health care uh, and what we uh, accomplished related to health care in the House budget. When we talk to our constituents, health care is an issue that's on their minds, obviously is important to them, and something they want us to continue to be on the look for and to make improvements on. This year, we passed a number of reforms in the House of Delegates um, that help address health care and ac access to affordable health care and controlling those costs. We've had discussions and ongoing discussions with COPN reform. We've adopted um, legislation that I carried dealing with direct primary care, which we think will improve access for our citizens. Delegate Stolle had legislation on assisted associate physicians. Uh, that will help veterans and other, um, with medical experience um, hopefully get good health care related jobs. Now Medicaid is something that we'll agree to disagree on uh, for some of us, but the House budget does not include um, Medicaid expansion under uh, the Affordable Care Act, and that's something we've made clear. We've been steadfast in that position, and the House budget reflects that. Now's not the time to expand what I think many of us believe is a broken system and leave our taxpayers on the hook for a bill, um, and we don't believe that, that doing so would be the answer. Other states are having difficulties related to their Medicaid expansion. In fact, the Associated Press reported last year that more, more than a dozen states that expanded Medicaid have seen enrollment surge well beyond their original projections. And obviously, that's led to higher cost. In Michigan, it's estimated the costs have shot up by 50% because of soaring enrollment uh, in their Medicaid expansion program. Ohio's projected costs have more than doubled. Now, I think all of us would agree that Virginia did not follow that same path, and I think that wisdom is bared out, um, borne out for us um, because we've not seen any of those types of impacts on our budget. 
We also, at the same time, in addition to opposing Medicaid expansion, do believe that the health safety net is important, and we need to strengthen and improve that. And the House budget reflects that. We believe in taking care of our neighbors, but instead of expanding government and raising taxes, um, as the provider tax would have done, the House has proposed a number of measures to strengthen our health safety net. The House budget invests $28.9 million in new funding to build a stronger safety net for our citizens. It builds on the previous uh, efforts by the House to provide services for individuals with serious mental illnesses and substance abuse disorder. It expands targeted behavioral health and substance abuse treatment services to individuals with serious mental illnesses. It expands Medicaid substance abuse treatment to provide a comprehensive array of treatment services, and it builds on a um, provider capacity to be able to provide those services. It also expands funding for community health services, behavioral health services. It adds, and this is something that Delegate Cox and I are fond of, and I know a number of members are, it adds new individual and family support waiver slots to address the critical waiting list that we have for our citizens who are waiting for those services. It also creates two new PAC teams, and that's something that we've had bipartisan support on and believe are important. It increases eligibility for our GAP program to 80% of the pot federal poverty level from the 60% that we adopted last year. It provides funding for one-time expenses for development of community housing options with specialized services and capital improvements to transition individuals from training centers um, or those who actually lack other housing options. And for those in uh, the Roanoke region and Southwest, it keeps Catawba Hospital open until a delayed plan on how we're going to approach our mental health system across the state is put in place. It also convenes a work group of agencies across the secretariats to examine the current cost and protocols for purchasing high cost medications and make recommendations to improve the cost effectiveness of purchasing those medications. All great reforms and I think great um, issues. It also, Mr. Speaker, adds language to implement a number of JLARC recommendations related to Medicaid eligibility and that process. That was something that JLARC worked on diligently, and as you all may remember, was a resolution this House and the Senate adopted to look at our Medicaid program. Now, Mr. Speaker, and ladies and gentlemen of the House, all those things, I think, are things that both sides of the aisle can support as part of our House budget, and I hope the members on both sides will support um, our budget on Thursday. In closing, Mr. Speaker, let me just say that the budget proposals um, that I've mentioned here shows that we're serious about health care in Virginia, and we're serious about taking care of our neighbors. They're the people we represent. The proposals also, I think, show that we can do this in a fiscally responsible manner without breaking the bank, and more importantly, without leaving the bill for taxpayers in the future, or to make it difficult for them to have their hard-earned dollars that they want. Mr. Speaker, um, I really hope that with this um, related to health care and with the budget, that I hope my colleagues on the other side of the aisle will join us on this side of the aisle in supporting these measures so that we can strengthen our health care system and adopt a House budget on Thursday. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.